a good dynamic and I said Ali I'm star scientist at uh, the Carter Institute of Nanotechnology, Technology and IQMT. I'm also the co-leader of work group seven and uh, that's the work group meeting that's on uh, on today. Uh, so we're, we're, the group is uh, principally looking at uh, uh, standards and safety so a theme running through this that people talk about their research but there's the theme about standards or safety or health in the matter. Oh, here. Yep. That should work. Sure. No. That's, that's, that's it. That's okay. Right. So, standards, what are standards? Standards are technical specifications, defining requirements of products, uh, production processes, services, test methods or to establish common terminology within a specific sector. The latter bit sounds a bit dull, but that really is important. So common terminology, so people know they're, talk they're talking the same language. Um, chemists and physicists know that for a long time. They uh, talk about very similar things, but use different language. <laughs> so according to the European Union, and um, which is probably true, standards are a driver for innovation. So they, the elaboration of relevant scientific uh, technical data, or, uh, also known as pre-normative research. So this kind of pre-normative research is the key for the standardization process. So this is what will lead you to the drafting of a standard and then establish the regulatory framework. Um, and the idea is that Europe will be a leader in this rather than a follower. So your research is important, uh, but it's also important that you're actually part of the, the process, that, uh, uh, that, that's the pre-normative process. So standards matter because they promote innovation through early market uptake. That's the reason I say we should be leaders, uh, not followers. Uh, technology transfer and interoperability between devices and, uh, and services. So things which work together, we can think of any number of things which are very similar, but don't, are not actually compatible. But I won't go to that at the moment. They increase quality and safety by defining features in many products and services, enabling jobs and growth, and increases the, growth, the GDP by 03 to 0.9%, uh, supporting global value chains by opening markets for companies and overcoming positive fragmentation in the single market. So the idea is it's a voluntary market driven consensus based on the standardization process. A lot of words, um, but the bottom line is uh, money is involved in this and it's worth taking it seriously. So at the EU level, institutionally, the platform standards development is provided by three EU standard organisations, European Committee for Standards, CEN, European Committee for Electronic Standardization, CENILEC, and the European Telecommunications Standards Institute. If you've looked recently, you'll see that CEN and CENILEC have emerged website. I am always going to copy some bits on their website, but I think it's probably a good idea interested to have a look because it, they've got a couple of nice uh, um, um, pictures on the website which shows all the areas they're involved in and it's a lot uh, uh, very important so although industry usage is at the center of standardization development several European initiatives have been launched in order to get the research community further engaged in the standards so the other is if uh, uh, I think Tony's going to say a bit more about this about researchers really have to be talking to uh, uh, people in industry or people in commerce. Uh, and we're talking about the same things and, and heading down the same route. That's much better at the outset. So there's a joint initiative on standardization, uh, which is to put in science in stand work standards, the various workshops and activities with the and same as mentioned, and in the research and innovation uh, supervised by STEP. You can tell the CEU because uh, uh, acronyms abound. So, uh, but they've got various working groups working at different levels. Uh, that's the important thing to know. Right, so the significance of standards for nanotechnology, that's us, I guess. So global competition is intense. Well, I didn't tell you that. Standards are significant enablers for commercial success at all stages of innovation, from the research development to the recycled disposal. So this is an important thing. The EU is very keen on the, uh, the Green Deal, um, post grain you know, so in other words, at the research outset, one should really be thinking about, is this going to be a commercial product? And therefore, what's going to happen at the end? What's going to happen about recycling or disposal or reuse, in fact? So successful innovation in land technologies requires standards based on the best of each, each nation's science and engineering. Standards not based on this 
will actually um, put a, a block in the way of innovation and it'll mean you'll be stuck uh, in technologies which you're used to, but after a while you'll find that the world's moved on and these aren't good enough anymore and you're left behind. So you'll have to buy in to what they, uh, they're now selling. So, and the various, the various documents on standards and consensus specifications uh, move this field forward. So this consensus specification business, uh, so as mentioned by some of the earlier speakers about uh, um, graphene nanoplatelets or, or graphene oxide. So uh, what do people agree they are? How do you measure them? And what are the standards in their field? And this does influence research and development and the business model. So, former director of uh, NIST said, standards enable innovation products and new markets. So, uh, it's, the, it's the innovator and it also means that uh, uh, you can open up areas which have not been thought of yet. So, in this action, we're looking at the action is called Essence, so looking at, uh, at uh, smart sensor materials uh, based on carbon and it's very wide brief. Uh, that's just as well because uh, carbon uh, comes in many, uh, many forms. So nanodiamond, fullerenes, uh, various sorts, carbon uh, onions. So one of the people within the group, uh, Silvia Giordani, is uh, probably the, uh, the one who's written quite a lot about this for various applications. Single nanotubes, multiple nanotubes, and graphene. And the uses, well, they're pretty manifold. So uh, Diamonds are uh, not only uh, the person's best friend, uh, they're also very good in industry for those cutting tools and uh, very specialty products. Uh, graphite has been around a very long time and in uh, most, most things which use some kind of uh, carbon, um, uh, amorphous uh, uh, graphite is the one of choice because it's good, it's good material, also it's cheap. Uh, graphene, as we've heard mentioned earlier with Larry and the others, um, it's a material that sees a lot more usage, uh, but then that depends on, on how smart the innovators are in that. And, then, and also fullerenes, which uh, although they've been around a long time, uh, people are still interested in and they have got uh, some ideas and applications for them. But all of these things, uh, one has to think about certain aspects about safety, also about standards. And within some of them, there are some stand standardization. It has been around for a while. So uh, for the new materials and new ideas, um, new standards have been developed. And uh, this is where we play a part in that uh, we uh, should say, look, this is the way that, uh, that things should be measured so that you're all preparing the same sort of thing. I put this slide here, stone, as you see from NASA, because uh, space uh, or sp things to do with space uh, uh, captures people's imagination. And certainly anyone ent entering uh, uh, into research as a youngster, we're certainly captivated by the idea of space and applications in, 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 uh, in space technology and engineering. Now, as we see from this point of view from NASA, there's a lot of things that are involved. Uh, some things are quite simple, but other things are very complicated. And as you see, their time scale goes from sometime in the past to actually only a short term in the future now. And a lot of these things are happening. So, you recognize this fellow in Moore's Law. In electronics, you look at the, the top down process. You've got uh, CPU performance doubling every 18 months, but this depends on the technology. And as you see, it, the modernization process on uh, the RD time scale uh, certainly motor the head. And he was certainly right. I think he, uh, yes. And then uh, on the bottom up approach, you've got the use of electric building block, blocks, integration of electric building blocks. And so you've got things becoming miniature and then the uptake into applications. And as you see there, smart uh, uh, monitoring condition monitoring systems for PV arrays, uh, systems for trains and batteries. So we've, as we've heard in, in some earlier talks, it's talked about uh, nanoparticles, nanolayers, nanostructure materials, the metal building blocks, and these basically are going to be what we see in a lot of the electronics and technology. Basically, we will be having nano-enabled systems. So you'll see something, but at the heart of it, there's going to be something that's nano-enabled. So uh, earlier this year, this is uh, uh, Stefan Roche, who 
because uh, one of the big big names in the graphene flagship. I see he's looking rather concerned in this talk. So this is the Carbon Dunahagen series of meetings. So this was his tutorial on polycrystalline graphite in February this year. And he gave this nice talk, which you can see online. So this is a plug for this, uh, this uh, workshop. You can, uh, you can go through these talks. And in this slide, which I shamelessly stole, but I've acknowledged it, he said, need for standardization in characterization. In other words, uh, you've got these new materials, you've got ways of characterizing them, but how do you compare? Uh, pen. So you need to have standards, even at that level. And one of the big standards in this area, it's not worth that, but go through it all, is the ICETC 113 on nanoelectronic technologies. Established a while back, it's got a quite a broad remit into in standardization of technologies relevant to uh, the various systems we talked about, you know, there's a nano -able, nano enabled technologies. So the standards refer to terminology, measurement, characterization, performance, reliability, durability, environment, and of course, uh, a bit that we're interested in health and safety, but of course, this isn't something that's on its own, it's part of the health system. And as you see at the end, we mentioned a number of things, replication areas, fuel cells, PVs, electrical storage, all, all, the, all the buzzwords of the day, and all the things which uh, are being funded by uh, funding bodies and also of great interest to industrial bodies. And these are some examples of the standards spinning out from IEEE CTC 113. And as you see, it's one or two things <laughs> covering fuel cells, fiber optics, lamps, you name it, uh, anything that you think might be relevant to the area, it's certainly there. So there's this uh, terminology, safer by design. So this is uh, taken from a paper by um, one of the people on the action, whose name I should have put the boss but <laughs> sorry, I put them. Uh, but the idea of safe by design is uh, so at the outset, when you, when you carry out your research, you're thinking about uh, what you're going to do and then what's going to happen when it moves from the lab bench into the pilot plant, into the industry, and of course, at the end of the life. So you have to think about how you design it at the outset. So I mentioned that innovation is driving force. <laughs> so this is the Dallara Academy, set up by uh, Ms. Ms. Dallara uh, a while back. In the background, uh, can they see this? So, probably not. I should uh, just think about the is that the laser pointer. But it's better if you use the laser pointer. Laser pointer, right. And it can see so, it. in the background, yeah. you can see the research and development section of the Lara plus um, uh, the manufacturing plant. And this bit here is where I was at a, an academy um, learning about fiber, not come fiber materials. You probably can't see here, but there's a as a museum of very interesting uh, Formula, Formula 3 and uh, Formula 1 cars. So why do I mention Dallara? Because they made a uh, fiber monocoque design. So this was a big innovation in, uh, in safety. So that was first introduced in 1985. So the F3, that's the F3 race. F385 was Dallara's first monocoque using carbon fiber. As you see, there's their website there. Well worth having a look at, it's really interesting stuff. It's using aeronautically derived composite materials um, in sort of go, uh, going down through the races, because uh, the top end is Formula One, and that's the big money, but then there's racing at all sorts of other levels where uh, speed and safety is of great importance. So carbon fibers uh, were spin out from World War II, which was a jolly long time ago, but they've been now used a lot, mundane things like trucks, uh, uh, but to rather sexy things like uh, these racing cars. So this is a photo I took, as you see, I had a great time each day walking through the uh, exhibition area, admiring the cars on the way to the uh, lecture hall. So in 1988, uh, they had the first uh, victory in the Indianapolis 500 race. Uh, this legendary circuit is covering an average speed of 370 kilometers an hour. So you've got a 500 mile race, and they're whacking along at that rate of knots, and that's the average. And so the, the Lara did a lot of work on the uh, carbon fiber materials uh, for these, uh, these cars. And it's the manufacturers won the race the most times in history. And in fact, from, let's say here, from 2012, all the cars on the track are made by Delara. Uh, so they make uh, uh, body work, uh, but uh, the race companies uh, have their own uh, engines and drivers. So it's an interesting race in that, um, essentially they've got a very similar car, but then it's down to the skill of the race engineer 
and the racing driver. So what we see here, and this is an F1, this is uh, what they call a halo. This is a recent red rail well mounted, a recent innovation in F1. Uh, uh, all these uh, safety devices are, are controversial. So you're looking for ways to make it safer for the driver, safer for uh, the spectators. But uh, there's, a, there's always a cost in terms of money and cost in terms of, uh, of uh, performance. But uh, this is a widely accepted uh, feature. And if you look closely, you can see this is a nice, nice piece of carbon fiber material. So risk management and technology. So I'll emphasize this once more. Companies standardize clear and easy uh, message. In, in other words, they, they need to, you need to be simple enough so they, so they can work out how to implement the risk management process. Because with technology, they need to know what technology is, uh, what are the problems that might come about with their usage, and then they feed that back into their, their risk management how technology is managed in their plants, uh, how to protect their workers, but also what happens when they put the product out into the field. In other words, the uh, consumer has to be uh, uh, protected as well. Uh, and so this is uh, my last example, which uh, fortuitously came off on the BBC website. Uh, so, uh, so this is the, the, uh, the journalist who reported it. So, uh, Although, once again, shamelessly stolen from another source, acknowledged. So the way it works out is if you acknowledge your sources, that's called research. If you don't acknowledge your sources, that's called plagiarism. <laughs> so there you are. Anyway, so apparently half of the charges sold to the new in 2018 had a USB uh, connection. Um, USB, USB micro B, 29% had a USB C, and 21% a lightning conductor. So, so the politicians decide, well, actually, it's probably a good idea if there's a good, uh, common standard. And funnily enough, they've been looking at that for a jolly long time. <coughs> and um, is it, I think it was uh, you know, Alan who mentioned that there are, uh, uh, waste products and the way that ends up in landfill. It's amazing how these things build up. So I realized that uh, the disposal of unused charging cables generated more than 11,000 tons of waste per year. And in 2009, there were more than 30, 30 different charges. Uh, at least now there are only three, but I thought that was bad enough. But yes, so as someone the uh, analyst said a while back, having one common uh, charging standard would be a victory for common sense in the eyes of the consumer. Goodness me, well, isn't that obvious? Well, <laughs> it may have been obvious, but uh, it's taken a while to come about. And uh, luckily it's been worked on. And so that's the end of my talk. So uh, this is me next to the car. I, uh, so I had to stand back a bit and wipe off you know, the, the drool. <laughs> so this is a Lancia large Monte Carlo. I had a Monte Carlo. No, I had a large. It wasn't a Monte Carlo a, a while back. But uh, yes, I still dream. <laughs> and in the background, actually, uh, this chap on the big screen up there, uh, that's Mr. Delara himself. Uh, he's 85 now. He still comes into work. <laughs> uh, quite a, we didn't meet him because, you know, uh, <laughs> But uh, yes, it's, uh, you know, I was very captivated by this. Uh, it was interesting to see that uh, uh, innovation here really was a driving force for innovation. Thank you.